and welcome to Doc Review with me, Camelia Shambayati. In this episode, we'll be reviewing Betting on Zero, directed by multi-award winning director Ted Braun. And joining me in the studio today, we have Tim Roby, who is a film critic for The Daily Telegraph and who is also a regular guest on BBC Film 2017 and Radio 4's film programme. And sitting next to him, we are also joined by political economist Clive Menzies, who is involved in Critical Thinking, a research and educational project which seeks to understand how the political economy works and identify levers for change. Now, Betting on Zero is a thrilling documentary that investigates the economic scam behind US corporate health giant Herbalife, the nutrition supplement company that's been widely condemned as the largest pyramid scheme in history. The film follows hedge fund titan Bill Ackman, who's placed a billion dollar bet against Herbalife as he argues the company will collapse, while Herbalife executives claim Ackman is a market manipulator out to bankrupt them. Well, let's have a look at our first clip. What are we going to learn? You're going to learn why Herbalife is going to collapse. Bill Ackman is on a holy war. A couple times we come across a company we think is causing harm. We can make money betting against that company. Herbalife stock goes down, we make money. Herbalife stock goes up, we lose money. And that's short selling. How much money have you spent betting against Herbalife? Over a billion dollars. What are you accusing Herbalife of? Of being a pyramid scheme. This is a legitimate company. That's a bogus accusation. Multi-level marketing. They tap into beliefs we have that you can accomplish whatever you want to. The wildest dreams you've ever thought of can come true in Herbalife. They took my dreams, my hope to be successful. Yo perdí 16 mil dólares. Estaba invirtiendo 1,600 dólares o más. 22 mil dólares. The kind of people that can do that, I mean, they're crooks. Carl Icahn, the famed hedge fund trader, taking out a big stake in the company, pretty much because he hates Bill Ackman. Since then, we saw the stock double. Ackman is a liar. He was like one of these little Jewish boys crying that the world was taking advantage of him. He essentially could crush Ackman short. I bought it because I really think it's a good product. He's not there because he believes in Herbalife's product. He's doing it because he thinks he can make money by squeezing Bill Ackman. This industry is going to continue to burn people. We haven't penetrated the markets and communities anywhere close to what we're going to see. And you, with us, it's family, and nobody messes with the family. Welcome both of you to the show. And Tim, if I could start with you as our guest film critic, what were your impressions of this documentary? I think it's really very well constructed, actually. Uh, and as someone who wasn't familiar with a lot of the specific uh, issues around this company, I thought it did a very lucid job of explaining uh, the kind of case for and against. Um, I think it kind of takes a side in the end, but I was sympathetic to the side it took. Uh, and I especially liked, what I must say, is that you, you watch a lot of films about um, kind of massive corporations or companies which take a kind of David versus Goliath stance on it. What I like about this film, and that's unusual about it, is it's Goliath versus Goliath. Uh, and they have kind of, they have opposing viewpoints which kind of come into conflict. And I found the conflict so compelling that by the end of the film, I wanted to race to my computer immediately to find out what the latest sort of part of the story was, really, because it obviously continues beyond where the film can take us. Right, and Clive, as a political economist, what was your take on this film? I, I thought it was very well done. Um, and I, I felt the film operated on multiple levels. And I think there were, if you watch the film, understanding multi-level marketing and, and the actual scam itself, and then you look at the parallels within the economy itself, I think the, this is, it came across as, an excessive example of so much of what happens today, rather than being it's an out and out scam, unusual and, and totally different. It was just pushing the envelope that bit further. But there were a lot of parallels in a lot of other commercial arenas, really. Tim, would you say this is a portrayal of the American dream gone wrong? You could see it that way, actually, yes. And as well as uh, the parallels with commercial 
um, kind of ventures. You can also see the parallels with something like Scientology. Uh, I thought that the, the language being used to kind of, if you like, sucker a lot of these people into the uh, pyramid scheme in the film so it reminded me a great deal of the language used to get Scientologists Would you say that was cult-like behaviour then? Well, it feels like it. And these big rallies that they throw where everyone's kind of standing up and whooping and hollering and kind of con congratulating themselves for being high enough up the tree to benefit from the scam while ignoring the massive sector of people below them who they've essentially conned into doing it themselves. I mean, it's, it's a terrible kind of uh, circular logic, which means that they, they're in denial about it being a pyramid scheme because the second they deny it, the whole thing crumbles. Well, we're going to talk about that in our next section, actually, as we take a look now at our next clip from Betting on Zero, which talked about why Herbalife was an economic scam. I got a degree in business, so that it's pretty obvious. It, it, that's going to keep going down. That's a pyramid. It's not sustainable. The idea here is you're going to build this business only recruiting six people, and each of them recruiting six people. But you're coming in at nearly the bottom of the pyramid. And by the time you get to level 13, your prospects are pretty dim because you have to recruit twice, more than twice the population of the world. That's when I started to learn more about the different ways that they used to recruit people. Right before I got into the company, it was selling leads. I'm like, okay, so I'm basically in a, caught up in a phase right now. I'm in the nutrition club phase. <laughs> and I was like, and I'm on the tail end of it. I'd made a mistake, but I've signed a three-year lease for five clubs. Most people will recruit a new distributor and convince them to actually take over the lease and then they'll skate off and draw commission off of, of the person they just scammed into taking over their lease. The kind of people that can do that, I mean, they're crooks. When you know, when you're trying to get somebody into a business that you know they're going to fail, that is a crook. I did have uh, a close friend, uh, you know, roommates through college, and, and his nutrition club was failed. We had a, a pretty much complete falling out over the deal because um, I'm the one that introduced him to Herbalife. It was clearly a pyramid scheme, but when you're that heavily invested, it's kind of hard six months in to say, oops, screwed up. He was one of the lucky characters in the film who managed to get away from Herbalife without it ruining his life. Um, Tim, can I ask you, um, sorry, Clive, can I ask you, um, what this film revolves around the immorality of pyramid schemes. Could you explain to our viewers just briefly what they are and how they work? Um, well, the graphic gives a fairly good indication. When you were a child, did you ever get involved in chain letters? where you would copy out a letter four times and send a pound or whatever it may be. The idea being that you send it to four people, they put your name up the list, put theirs at the bottom, and over time you accumulate money. Well, you don't need to be a genius to see that sooner or later you run out of people who are going to send money up the tree. And, and as the man interviewed says, once you get to level 13, you've got to recruit twice the population of the planet. So clearly, it is unsustainable. It is a really good business for those who get in early uh, because there is a, there, the word churn is used a lot in the film. Uh, and basically, a churn, people are churned. They, they get absorbed by the hype that Tim described. They, they buy into the dream, they invest their money, they become disillusioned, they go out, and then more people come in. So it, it, it's reliant on getting as many people through the pipeline as possible, because as long as they're investing, then they're pumping money up the pyramid to the top, and the people near the top of the pyramid make all the money. Yes, it's, it's okay for them, but not to the people, the majority sure. of people down the bottom. Um, Tim, why is this scheme so appealing to people then, as shown in the documentary? Well, they're fed this this kind of myth of the American dream, if you like. If you like, they're they're encouraged to believe that in getting in on this uh, on this system, uh, that they're going to be able to climb their way up the ladder. But what it actually does, as I think you sort of suggested earlier, is it, it what it tends to do is reinforce the existing 
hierarchy or pyramid of capitalism. And it's the people at the top who have the influence and power who set the ball rolling. Uh, and it's the people who are already at the bottom of the tree who are sort of encouraged, but are just sort of shoved to the bottom of another tree, essentially. Uh, and they still don't profit from it because they, 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 they've come in too late, essentially. It's too late. All the profit that's going to be made out of this scheme really has been made already. Um, and the, 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 the company and you know, the people involved, it's, it's in their vested interest to pretend that everything is still all fine, to keep reinvesting in it, to keep it this sort of illusion of it being afloat and, and viable, because the second that they stop being able to recruit, then the money will dry up for them as well. And why, uh, Clive, um, why do you think it took so long for the authorities to investigate herbal life? Interesting. Just before answering that, I think the film acts as a metaphor for the whole economic system, because, the, because it is unsustainable. But coming back to why the authorities, um, Bill Ackman refers to Bernie Madoff, he was closely involved with the SEC. Um, it's probably not time to go into it now, but there have been numerous examples of people trying to whistleblow about severe systemic flaws in the system, mm. the financial system, and they've been ignored or worse. Mm. And Ben uh, Blackman does a good job of this, and I think we're going to talk about him in the next section because now we're going to look at another clip from the documentary, Betting on Zero, which focuses on one of the film's main characters, Bill Ackman. So we reached out to Latino grassroots organizations for a national victim recruiting campaign. I think we committed as much as $130,000 to that effort. Mr. Ackman has made a lot of donations to these nonprofit organizations, stuff like that, that we simply don't know about. We only know a sliver of that. So people question, is he simply bringing the information to regulators, or is he doing things that maybe he shouldn't be doing? The day after this fairly horrible New York Times article, I was having an advisory board meeting and I said, look, you know, what do we have to do? It just, I can't believe the government hasn't acted. You know, maybe the right thing to do is we cover the position, just decide that we're somehow interfering because the government's afraid to step into a situation with a short seller. We actually had a discussion. And in the middle of that discussion, I got a call from our trader, our head trader, Rami Sai, said, Bill, Herbalife stock's been halted. And uh, I said, perhaps there is a God. <laughs> Clive, I want to pick up on the point you were making earlier about Bill Ackman acting as sort of a whistleblower character. Um, what do you make of his contribution in this film? It, we tend to think of characters in binary terms. They're either good or bad. Um, and we're all on a spectrum of good and bad. Um, it's just the, the nature of people. I think Ackman was initially motivated to make money. But I, I sense through the film, and one cannot tell, um, one would have to spend a lot more time looking at what he's been doing. But I think he's, he's as somebody said, he, he's on a mission. Um, and I'm not sure that Carl Icahn is the focus of his mission. I think he, he has a genuine desire to bring this company down because he thinks it's fundamentally wrong. Um, so in that sense, all power to him. Um, but I don't think one should get too teary-eyed because, you know, whichever way it goes, Bill Ackerman will survive. Um, but but Tim, I, would you agree with that analysis? Um, do you think that uh, this ca character Ackerman was portrayed in a good light in this film, or what his, his motives were? Well, I think Clive actually landed on one of the things I like the most about the film, which is the kind of ambivalent treatment of him. Um, he is a very slippery customer, and it's possible to see him as on the right side, but for the wrong reasons initially, if you like. Um, but as the film goes on, he, you can sense his frustration that his argument is not coming across very well and is being combated, in fact, by his enemies in, on Wall Street, essentially, uh, who are throwing more money into uh, Herbalife to kind of sustain it, keep it afloat in this somewhat artificial way. And to way. him off. And to, yeah, exactly, and to kind of deprive him of the profit he's, he's gunning for. And then he starts to make the moral argument more and more forcefully, and then he hopes that the FTC are going to back him on it. And he even says to some of the, the victims, you know, I'm going to give away 100% of my profit from this. And exactly how that would work has, remains a little bit unclear. Because on the honest. one hand, you have him trying to make a more moral argument against Herbalife, but he's also bet a billion dollars against it. But then he said he'd give that to charity. But I think, I think this what do you is make what, of his, his methods? Yeah, it's precisely why I find the film so fascinating, is that he is, in, 
in that Goliath position as a kind of um, king of Wall Street, uh, betting against the company. He examines, he looks at the lie of the land and he decides this company is, is, is a phony, essentially, uh, and that it shouldn't really be doing what it's doing. And if I, if I get in there quickly enough, I can profit from its failure. But then, of course, he does have this vested interest. So it's a very complicated and interesting role. I can actually see, I could see a kind of Hollywood spin-off of this story, which would make him very much the main character, uh, and in which it would be a very interesting multifaceted figure. Yeah. But was, go on. If I can just clarify, what was not clear in the film when you talked about the $100 million? I think that's I think what it was he a billion dollars. No, his, was his, what he was prepared to give away. Right. He expected to make $100 million. Mm. That was personally. Pershing Square Capital is a hedge fund that looks after a lot of other people, people's money. So they would make money, but he personally wouldn't, I suspect, is, I see. is the yeah, indication. That's, that's the, yeah. It's not explicit, but that was my assumption, because if you're betting a billion, mm. you're not going to bet a, a billion at this sort of level of risk for a 10% return. Mm -hmm. Can we explain million. while we're on the subject to our viewers about this concept of short selling? So Bill Ackman was trying to short sell against Herbalife. I thought he gave an excellent explanation, which was probably more complicated than it need be. But essentially, you're selling something that you haven't got. So let's say that we're trading notebooks. And this notebook today is worth $100. And I believe the value of notebooks is going down. Um, or you believe the value of notebooks are going down. So you say to me, can I borrow your notebook? You go and sell it for $100. The price falls to $50. You can then buy back a notebook and give it back to me and make a $50 profit. That, in essence, it's selling something you haven't got. That doesn't belong to you. Expecting the price to go down and then buying it back at the cheaper rate and pocketing the difference. Tim, do you think this is OK? Or what do you think of this technique? Well, I, I think there's a lot of kind of ethical issues you could have with, with short selling. Um, and, and, you know, watching something like the Hollywood film The Big Short, I, I considered a lot of these practices to be quite dubious, really. Yeah, very uh, but then they're yeah. really built into the fabric of capitalism, though, in, in, in many ways. I mean, if you look at the ways that profit is generated, it's in, in, in most respects, you can have similar issues with it. Um, I think it's, in a way, they're a little bit more brazen and upfront about it. That's all these big short sellers. And in the case of Ackman, he's intelligent enough to grasp that it's only going to work if he picks a company which has this rot, rot at its core, if you like. If he tries to take down a, a, a decent company selling a good product, uh, and just decides, yeah, the people are going to go off that product. I think that's in, in some ways more unethical than choosing a company which he thinks is in fact doing wrong mm -hmm. and, and whose removal from, um, you know, uh, uh, from, from the marketplace, if you like, will actually help a lot of people in the long run. We'll have to leave it there for now as we take a look at our final clip from Betting on Zero, which looks at the story of one Latino victim of herbal life. We are here by the place where my office, my construction office was. I was sitting in my office when the Herbalife guy came to knock my door. He started showing me the, the products. He started preparing me things, uh, teas, uh, shakes. And they are telling me they are making a lot of money, $20,000, $80,000 in a month. So, you know, that was something to, to think a little bit. Help a lot of people, do an easy work, not dangerous anymore. So that's why I started switching my construction business to Herbalife. So I opened the club, buying thousands of dollars of products. I was feeling, you know, oh, I found Herbalife, the best company in the world. My upline, Miguel Uruchima, and he helped me to fix the place, anything that I need to open the club. Like anybody can dream, you know. Nice neighborhood here. There is a lot of uh, Hispanic people, they were coming to my club. I was trying to do my best for the people. I was not pushing them to, to take the product. I was just le letting them to, to taste, to, to rest, to talk in my place, to start liking that place. This, this was uh, my, my club, nutritional club here. So 
from here all the way. That was a big front of my business. My upline told me, the more you spend, the more you will make. That was the thing that made me feel so sad because I believed to this person that I thought that he was my, my friend. It's truly heartbreaking seeing the stories of the victims of herbal life, and particularly, which is mainly from the Latino community we learned from this documentary. Tim, do you think this documentary does a good job in telling the victims' stories? Uh, it does the best it can. I mean, he's sort of, sort of the archetypal example of someone who was roped into it. The, the Hispanic community disproportionately uh, found themselves at the brunt end of, of uh, the butt end of herbal life, if you like. And, and a lot of them, unfortunately, were really unwilling to come forward uh, because they're scared. Some of them are undocumented. I mean, it, it's a particularly pernicious community for uh, the company to kind of target in, in terms of trying to get its revenue. Um, I think you really need the victims' voices to be in there, and there are quite a lot of them in there. And they, they, they attempt this class action suit, which misfires in various ways because the legal system still is sort of set up to protect a company like Herbalife uh, and, and to allow it to get away with very, very small payouts in these situations, which re where really it should be paying a lot more. Yeah. Um, I did find it very interesting that the FTC uh, when they step in. Uh, yes, we learn at the end of the verdict. film that they make charges. And one them. does worry a little bit about what's going to happen now under the new administration because, of course, deregulation is famously what Republican governments do. Uh, it's what Reagan did in the 80s. And we certainly worry that uh, you know if, if Trump puts certain people in certain positions on those boards that the regulation is going to fly out the window. And well, really, we also learned from the yeah. end of the film that Donald Trump appointed uh, Carl Icahn, who is a billionaire business He's very much a herb uh, herbalizer investor. You yes, know, so, exactly. Yeah. As he has a special appointment as uh, advisor to the president on regulatory reform. Mm. Um, Clive, are you worried about this? Um, well, this is nothing new. I mean, essentially, the poachers are the gamekeepers in this. If you look at the round tripping between regulation, government positions responsible for regulation and policy, and the big banks, they go round and round. I mean, I could reel off numerous examples, uh, which we probably haven't got time for. Um, the system is inherently corrupt. We have this perception that this is, this is some malpractice in a market that functions properly. It doesn't. The market is manipulated at the highest levels. Um, and in the big short, which Tim mentioned earlier, the, it took so long for, and they nearly got killed or squeezed, as, as it's called, uh, by the stock, some prime prices continuing to go up. But in essence, everybody who was in on the game had to get out and get all the stock off to the suckers right. before the thing collapsed. So the regulators, you know, one can say that Trump is going to put in the fox in the chicken house in terms of putting Carl Icahn on, on some sort of regulatory committee, but that isn't a big step from what has been happening for decades <coughs> now. This is nothing new. And Tim, if, final 10 seconds to you or so. Um, was this film uh, documentary effective in its message? I really thought it was, yeah. It's one of the best things that I've reviewed on this program, I think, in terms of being very lucid at explaining the, li the lie of the land. Um, taking aside, and obviously the people behind the documentary have a position from the first place, but really making their argument very strongly. All right, thank you very much, gentlemen. And I'm afraid that's it for this episode of Doc Review. Thanks for tuning in. And make sure you follow us on Twitter and Facebook, where you can find us on at Doc Review Show. Do let us know your views on today's film, and you can even suggest a documentary that you would like us to review. I've been Camilla Shambayati, and see you on the next episode of Doc Review. <laughs>